Trinity is the basis and heart of the Christian religion. The first great subject treated in the creeds, the first great controversy that wrecked the whole Christian world and in which God finally gave deliverance. There is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and of Him, and through Him, and to Him are all things. Romans 11, verse 36. Now with that stated and understood, we now need especially to focus on the second person of the Holy Trinity, who is God the Son, and God the Word. And the three sermons we've had so far on the beginning of John's prologue will be of some help here. And the classes last season, in the last half of the season, on the Holy Trinity from Belgian Confession Articles 8 through 11 will also be of assistance. The Son, or the Word, like the Father, and the Spirit is eternal, personal, and divine. We're back to John 1 verse 1 again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The eternal, personal, and divine Word. Now in the Incarnation, God the Son, God the Word, took upon him human flesh. Before this, if the word before is appropriate, before this, the Word was God alone. Only God. Simply God. With the Incarnation, the Word is God and also man. This is what the word incarnation means. It comes from two words, carne, from which we get carnal or fleshly. So think flesh, incarnation, carn means flesh, and the in bit, well that means exactly what you think it means, so the incarnation is the infleshing of the Word, that God the Son came in the flesh. So before the incarnation, the Son had one nature, God. After the incarnation, the Son had two natures. Now he is God, and he is also man. Eternally then, he is God the Son. And then in time, 2,000 years ago, he became God the Son and man. And now he has two natures, God and man. Two natures. Yet he is not two persons, he is one person. And the person is the eternal Son of God, the I, who thought and willed and acted and took to himself a human nature, becoming a man. Christ is not a human person, he is a divine person. The Word, that's him, eternal became man, the incarnation. <clears throat> now what sort of a man did the word become? What can we say about the human nature of the incarnate Son of God? Let me give you some helpful adjectives, five of them. 
These are easy to remember too, I trust. And you'll probably be able to recall two or three of them at the end. Whether or not you retain more than that by tomorrow, that's a different matter. But for now, this is the easiest way to make it simple. Most obviously, this is the place to begin. Jesus Christ is a real man. Now, a real man is not here opposed to a woman. A real man here is that which is opposed to that which only seems to be a man or appears to be a man. Jesus is a real man in that he is not an image or a ghost. And you say, well, that's, that's very simple, very obvious. Who in the wide world would think that Jesus was anything other than a real man? Well, there's actually quite a lot of people. It's a heresy that's been with the church from earliest days until the 21st century. <coughs> so Jesus Christ was and is really human. Jesus Christ is as really human as you are or I am. Not a ghost, not a vision, nothing fleeting, real. That's the first adjective. Jesus has a real human nature. The next point, the Lord Jesus is a complete man. And again, we're not saying that he is macho or anything like that. By complete man, where we mean that he consists of both body and soul. The Lord Jesus is not just a human body without a human soul. He's not just a human soul without a human body. He is both body and soul. So Jesus had and was and is a human mind, a human body, a human will and a human soul or spirit. So if you put together the first two points and they're closely related, Jesus is really a man, not some sort of ghost. And Jesus is completely a man. There's no essential part of a human nature that he lacks. So when the Word became flesh, he became a real and complete man. Now the next key word requires a little bit more explanation. Jesus Christ is a central or covenantal man. And here we're dealing with Christ's human descent or lineage. He's an individual human of a certain nation coming from a particular family line. The Lord Jesus was a Jew of the chosen nation of Israel. And he was a descendant, and now I'm picking the key names, he was a descendant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Judah and David and Solomon the most significant names. And what is significant about those names, those people, is that they are people particularly connected with the covenant. God's covenant was with Abraham, and so it flowed to Abraham's son, Isaac, who was called and from him it went to Jacob, whom God loved, but not Esau, whom he hated. Of the twelve tribes of Jacob, or Israel, the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. 
And then God made a covenant with David, a covenant which especially contributed a kingly, royal element. And then the house or dynasty of David especially descended through Solomon. And if I were to ask you which of the four gospel accounts especially emphasizes Christ as coming of this central covenant line, you would, I trust, answer Matthew. And you say that not only because I read that genealogy earlier in the worship service, but because you know that Matthew is especially the gospel for the Jews. So this is how it opens. Verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with David. Abraham begot Isaac. God established the covenant with Isaac too. And Isaac begat Jacob, and the covenant went with him. And Jacob begat Judas, or Judah. The Greek can't do an H at the end of a word like Hebrew can. Judah and his brethren. Then if you look down to verse 6, Jesse begat David the king. David the king begat Solomon that old sorry tale involving Bathsheba, whose name isn't even given in the genealogy here. Verse 17 sums it all up. All the generations from Abraham to David, 14. The generations from David to the Babylonian captivity, 14. From the Babylonian captivity to Christ, 14. But the names there, Abraham and David, the central covenant line. Christ is a real and complete human being, a man with a central covenantal humanity in that particular line of God's being. Our Heidelberg Catechism in answer 35 states that Christ is of the true seed of David. And the Belgic Confession is even more fulsome in contrast to the heresy of some of the Anabaptists in the Lowlands in the 16th century. The last paragraph of Belgic Confession 18 states that Christ is a fruit of the loins of David after the flesh, made of the seed of David according to the flesh, He's a fruit of the womb of the Virgin Mary. He's a branch of David. He's a shoot of the root of Jesse. He sprung from the tribe of Judah. He descended from the Jews according to the flesh. He's of the seed of Abraham, and he took upon him the seed of Abraham. Some of the Anabaptists deny that, likening Christ's birth through the Virgin Mary to something passing through a tube, but that she, the Virgin Mary, didn't contribute any flesh and blood, as it were, to her offspring, so that Christ wasn't really a covenantal saviour in the line of the people of God in the Old Testament. The truth is that the Word of God, becoming man, became a real man, not some sort of a ghost, a complete man, not half a man, or even 99% human, and a central covenantal man in the covenant line of the Old Testament church as he was prophesied. Now we need to see that in the incarnation the word became a weakened man. The Word did not take upon Himself unfallen human nature. When the Word became flesh, it 
does not mean that he was not liable to pain or sickness or death. He did not take the flesh like Adam's flesh before the fall. Rather, the son assumed a human nature that was prone to tiredness and suffering and grief like your human nature and mine. The idea being that thereby he is touched with the feelings of our infirmity. He became a man, not like Adam before the fall, and we couldn't have identified with him as fully, but he became a human like us. And of course, in that Jesus is a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, and so on. And they were partakers of weakened human flesh. So the son of David too. And finally, we need to see that the word became a sinless man. And I said, that's quite true, that Christ assumed a weakened human nature, that, that the weakened human nature was weakened because of the sin of Adam, but Christ's human nature, though weakened, was not sinful. Christ was just as sinless in his humanity as he is in his deity. He never sinned in his thinking or in any of his actions and there was no sin in his human nature. When he was tempted, therefore, there was nothing in him that was sinful, that was drawn by the temptation. He could feel the attractiveness of eating food, the first temptation in the wilderness. He could feel that temptation and understand how that would be desirable from a certain point of view because it would stop the pain of hunger, but there was nothing in him that willed to sin and everything in him that willed to obey the Father. Sinless. And as the incarnate Son of God, being in his person, the second person of the Holy Trinity, it was impossible for him to sin. He could not sin. This is what is known as the impeccability of Christ. He could not sin, and yet he was tempted. And he felt that temptation. But he didn't sin, and he couldn't sin. That deserves explanation at another time. And so, when the Word became flesh, he became really and completely man. And he was an individual man in the covenant line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David, etc. He was a wicked and yet sinless man. But did this incarnation of the Word in any way change the deity? And the answer to that is no. God is unchangeable. And the three persons in the Godhead are unchangeable. So when the Word became flesh, he was still fully God. The divine Word was not changed into humanity. Christ's humanity and deity were not mixed. The Lord Jesus is not half God and half man or any other combination of percentages. Rather, Jesus Christ is fully God. And if it helps you, you can say he's 100% God, so to speak. And he is also 
fully man. 100% man, so to speak. So he's still fully, perfectly, eternally God. And now, with the incarnation, he is also fully man according to his divine nature. These two natures, Christ's humanity and his deity, the fact that he is God and man, these two natures are inseparably and indivisibly joined forever. We're not to think, beloved, that when the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven, he stopped being a man. Or he stopped being really and completely man. <coughs> He's still fully man. His human nature isn't weakened anymore though. His human nature is glorified. But he is fully God and fully man now in heaven. And into all eternity he will always be fully God and fully man. The incarnation, you could say, is permanent. And the salvation of the church in heaven and throughout the new heavens and the new earth depends on the permanence of the incarnation. God can only bless us through the union of the divine and human in Christ. Therefore, that union must always remain. But since Christ is both God and man, you can now understand why apparently contradictory things are said of him. Why things can be said about the Lord Jesus with respect to his divine natures and his human nature that are totally opposed to one another in the most obvious and flagrant sense, so to speak. We can say, and that truly, that Christ is creator and creature. He is creator because in one nature he is God, and he is creature because according to the other nature, he is man. Creator and creature are inseparably joined together in the incarnation forever. We can say that Jesus Christ is infinite and circumscribed. Infinite meaning, amongst other things, limitless. Circumscribed meaning limited. As man, in his earthly ministry, he was about six feet tall, or five foot eight, or whatever it is we got told. That's circumscribed. That's limited. But as God, Jesus Christ fills heaven and earth. And both are true. And both are true even during our Lord's earthly ministry. For instance, we could have said of Christ in his Galilean ministry that he was in one particular place on earth, let's say in a house in Capernaum, occupying a certain amount of space, something akin to the space occupied by your body, because he was like us, of similar sort of height. And we could say that Christ, according to his divine nature, filled outer space and heaven and filled the entire divine being of God. We're talking of him in one sense according to his human nature and according to his divine nature in another sense. And likewise we could say that Jesus Christ was hungry and thirsty while on earth as a man and we can also say that he feeds all creatures as God. And we can also say that while Christ was thirsty at the well in Samaria, 
he was also giving drink to every creature on the earth because he's God. We can say too that as God, Christ cannot be tempted. James 1 teaches that. But as a man, he was tempted fiercely, yet never yielded for a moment. These are some of the obvious contrasts that necessarily flow from the truth of the incarnation that God and man are joined inseparably in the person of Jesus Christ forever. And we need to know this too, beloved, because this is the glory of our Lord and Redeemer, whom we worship and serve. This is the one who owns us, the one who bought us with his own blood. He's God and man. And this is the one who is able and willing and committed to building and defending his church. And this knowledge of the glory of Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son, the Word made flesh, ought to and does evoke our awe. It makes us wonder. How can this be? It stirs up our praise. It assures our souls. It comforts our hearts that we are the party of this one. The Word made flesh. He dwelt among us. And as I say, it helps you refute the heresies of the JWs and the other cultists who attack the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ with what may seem to you to be awkward questions. You know they're wrong, but you can't quite put your finger on it when they deny the deity of our Lord. When they say to you, for instance, James 1 says that God cannot be tempted with evil. Matthew's Gospel, for instance, tells us that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Therefore, Jesus is not God, because God cannot be tempted. And you say, no, 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 no. Jesus as God was not tempted, but Jesus as man was tempted. Our position is not that Jesus is God alone. The Orthodox position is that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And he cannot be tempted as regards to his deity, but he can and was tempted according to his human nature. And that literally, in my experience, has cleared the doorstep of JWs. Having understood, I trust, insofar as we can ever understand these things, what happened at the Incarnation, what it means, what the result of God's becoming man is, we need to consider this. How did God effect Christ's Incarnation? And the answer is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost effected the Incarnation. The Holy Ghost effected the Incarnation in the womb of of a virgin of all places. This is question 37, 35. What do these words mean? He was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. And the answer explains that the Word took upon him the very nature of man of the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary by the operation of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is involved in effecting the Incarnation. This is the teaching too of the chapter we read earlier, Matthew 1. Matthew 1 verse 18 states that before Joseph and Mary were married, before they had intercourse, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. That child is the human nature of Christ and he 
became a child by the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, this is the word of the angel. Verse 20, the angel says, Joseph, son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is not yours, you have to stand with her, not somebody else, some other man's, because she's a virgin. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So Christ's incarnation was effected in the womb of the Virgin Mary. The Word became flesh inside one particular woman in Galilee 2,000 years ago. And at its very beginning, Christ's human nature was as small and tiny as our human nature was at the beginning of our life. A tiny speck in the womb. That's the human nature of the Son of God at the very beginning of the Incarnation when the Holy Ghost gave conception to the Virgin Mary. But with us, we were formed through the contributions of both a human mother and a human father. The Lord Jesus was formed in his human nature of his mother alone. And through the miraculous operation of the Holy Spirit. And this is the wonder of the virgin conception and the virgin birth. This never happened before. And this never will happen again. It's a miracle. Women, as you know, do not conceive and bear children without a man involved. That's why Joseph in Matthew 1 was so perplexed and grieved. Women don't and women can't. But this particular woman did by the Holy Spirit. This is the wonder of that line in the Apostles' Creed. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. And in the light of this sermon, now you can grasp more fully but never perfectly the answer. What does it mean? It means this, that God's eternal Son, the Word, who is and continueth true and eternal God, because He, the second person in His divine nature, is not changed by the Incarnation, the eternal Son took upon Him the very nature of man, very means the true nature of man, a real human nature, a complete human nature, a weakened human nature, and yet also a sinless human nature. He took upon him the very true nature of man, of the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, so that he was literally and physically her son. And he did this by the operation and mighty work of the Holy Ghost, so that he might also be the true seed of David, of that central common line. Like unto his brethren in all things, human like us, sin accepted. And if you ask, as our catechism asks, what profit dost thou receive by Christ's holy conception and nativity? The answer is, first of all, it fits him as my mediator and the mediator of the whole church. And I say that's the first thing because that is precisely the first thing that the Catechism says. What problem? Answer. That he is our mediator. Point being that the mediator must be God and man. He must be God in order to bring us to God, to reveal God to us, and he must be man in order to be like us. And if God's in heaven, 
and we human beings are on earth, one who is God and man can be between us, relating as man to us and as God to God, second person to the other persons in the Holy Trinity. And that's the idea of a mediator. A mediator is a go-between, someone who effects reconciliation and brings together two or more parties, restoring fellowship. This work of Christ's mediation is especially evident at the cross. He had to be man. And as man, he suffers and dies for our sins, which were imputed to him. Only a man can die in our place. He must be a king of man. And as God, amongst other things, he is able to support his human nature so that the man Christ Jesus, when he suffers for our transgressions, is not crushed under the infinite wrath of Almighty God. What does this incarnation through Christ's holy conception and nativity, how does it profit you? That he's our mediator. And this is the exact same point that is made in the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 1. Verse 21 states, Mary shall bring forth a son, the angel tells Joseph, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, which means Jehovah salvation. So here's a son, and the son is Jehovah salvation, he's God man. And call him Jehovah salvation, for he shall save his people from their sins. And that's the result of Christ's mediation. He actually saves all of his people chosen in him before the foundation of the world, and he saves his people from their sins. All of his people saved from all of their sins. And then too, Matthew 1 verse 23 explains what happened by quoting Isaiah 7 verse 14, that celebrated prophecy, Behold, a virgin shall be the child, there's his humanity, and she shall bring forth a son, there it is again, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And the two letters E-L in the Hebrew means God. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. El is God and the Immanu is the Hebrew for with us. Emmanuel means God with us, the mediator who dwells with us as a man and he dwells in us by his Holy Spirit. That's the first prophet that he's our mediator. And the second benefit of our Lord's incarnation, and particularly the beginning of his incarnation, which is the focus of Lord's Day 14 particularly, the second benefit is that his sinless conception and birth covers our sinful conception of earth. Each and every human being our Lord accepted who was born, was born in sin and shapen in iniquity. We entered the world fallen and totally depraved, cuddly and cute as we were, totally depraved, because we sinned and therefore died in Adam, our first covenant hand. But the point of Lord's Day 14 is that the Lord Jesus, being conceived by the Holy Ghost, was born sinless. And if you want to talk about children being innocent, there really only is one truly innocent child. If you mean innocent in the sense that it's sinful if someone kills that child or it's wiped out in some war uh, that's committed no crime before the eyes of men, that, that's fair enough. But innocent in the eyes of God, no. Only one innocent child ever. And if you say Adam and Eve were innocent before the fall, that's true, that's true. 
but they weren't children. They were adults, and they weren't born. Only one innocent child. The only human being who ever was born perfectly holy and morally whiter than the driven snow. And the comforting message of Lord's Day 14, the message of Matthew 1, and the message of the babe in the manger is that his spotless holiness is reckoned to me. And it covers my sins and makes me whiter than the snow. And the message of the cross at the other end of our Lord's earthly life is that my sinful wickedness is reckoned to him. And that he, as my mediator, bore all my iniquities away. And this is the meaning, and this is the prophet of Christ's incarnation.